start you off. I wanted to start you off with a little video. Well, little video. It's 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 ten minutes uh, that I've I've done. Oh, hi, Chloe. It's a it's a ten minute video which I uh, I've done to sort of uh, focusing on the most uh, typical Q and A that I have been well Q rather so questions that I have been receiving during this Q and A sessions. I have been in my post now. For third, uh, third year, this is my third consecutive year as the admissions tutor for the politics and sociology. So I sort of have built up a bit of experience of the role. And uh, uh, I thought that rather than me talking to you, uh, oh, Masamichi, hi. Uh, I thought that uh, as part of the introduction, I will show you the video. There is one point that has to be updated though. Uh, the fact that uh, Russia's uh, unprovoked attack on Ukraine uh, on the 24th of uh, February earlier this year meant uh, that uh, uh, we were forced to suspend our uh, cooperation with uh, Russian universities. Uh, I can tell you a little bit more uh, and therefore uh, letting our students go to study there. Uh, I can tell you a little bit more about this in the Q&A after the video, but the primary reasons are the government sanctions against Russia and the fact that the deans of all the Russian universities with whom we were cooperating, unfortunately, have signed a letter supporting the special military operation. So that gave us no choice but to sort of suspend our cooperation for the moment indefinitely. So. There is one part of this video that refers to students going to Russia that is not now possible, but all the other answers still hold. So without further ado, let me uh, uh, share my screen. Uh, okay, um, actually, uh, I, th I think I'm going to stop share because I need to share and together make sure that you can hear my uh, you can hear my my video as well. So it's not only you, you will be able to okay share screen yeah optimize for video clip and share sound perfect uh, share. It's not playing anything for me. I don't know if anyone yeah. else oh. can it's, see anything. It's not. Okay. Thanks, Lisa, for telling me. Uh, it says uh, your screen is being paused. Why, why is it being paused? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to do stop share again. Uh, okay. I can see that now. You can see that now. Okay. Uh, and uh, can you also tell me immediately whether you can hear anything? Uh, it, it, you can't hear it yet. No. Yeah. Hello, my name is Agnieszka Kubal, yeah. and I'm a lecturer in sociology here at SEAS, University College London, and admissions tutor for the various politics and sociology master programs at SEAS. We offer three one-year MA programs in political analysis political sociology, Russian and post-Soviet politics. They complement the rich curriculum alongside the two-year IMES programs, which stands for International Masters in Economy, State and Society, covering the topics of security, politics and international economy. And as of this academic year, CIS is launching a new MA in Comparative Russian and Eurasian Politics, which is again a two-year master's with one year at UCL and one year at the Higher School of Economics in St. Petersburg, Russia. If, like me, 
you were brought up on the myth that the history in Eastern Europe and Russia ended in 1989, and after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we could only observe the progress towards the Western liberal style of democracies, marked by transition, NATO and the EU enlargements, well, it is time to wake up. Eastern Europe and Russia is where the politics is still very much happening. I would say the politics there is alive and kicking. The examples of the recent democratic backsliding in Hungary and Poland, the military conflict in Eastern Ukraine and the use of hybrid warfare, Russia's involvement in the war in Syria, or the most recent protests over the elections in Belarus. These are all events that make us revisit many of the theories that were originally to help us read and understand the region. The societies of Eastern Europe and Russia have changed on an imaginable scale in the last 30 years. People are socially and physically mobile. Polish is now the second most popular language in the United Kingdom, for example. Russia is the second largest destination for migrants globally, while the Eastern European countries like Poland, who experienced mass exodus of people in early 1990s and after the 2004 EU enlargement, are now experiencing transition from migrant sending to migrant receiving countries. If you are interested in these big political and social questions, issues of security, gender, migration, in Central and Eastern Europe. SEAS is the place for you to come and study. School of Slavonic and East European Studies, or SEAS at UCL, is the largest centre in the UK for the study of the region of Central, Eastern and Southern Europe and Russia, spanning Armenia and Azerbaijan in the south, Finland in the north, Poland and the former GDR Republic in the West, and Siberia in the East. It is one of the strongest research and teaching centre because of its people. Who will be teaching you at SEAS? Dr. Sean Henley offers a very popular module on the politics of Central and Eastern Europe, focusing in particular on the interaction of democratization processes with the building of a market economy and integration with the European Union. Sean brings in evidence and expertise from the Pop Rebel International Project, led by other CIS researchers, Professors Jan Kubik and Richard Mole. Pop Rebel aims to describe the rise of populism in Central and Eastern Europe, diagnose its consequences and propose policy solutions. Dr. Aglaya Snetkov is our resident expert in international relations. She offers a very popular module on the international politics of Eurasia, introducing the students to the cutting edge debates over Russian foreign policy, the politics and security of Ukraine and Belarus, the Caucasus and Central Asia. She does that alongside exploring the thematic questions, such as the role of international actors in the region, conflicts and energy disputes, regional integration mechanisms, and the future role of Eurasia in global politics. Andrew Wilson is a professor of Ukrainian studies at SIS, and he offers two MA modules, one focusing on the making of modern Ukraine, and the second one on undermining democracy and methods of political manipulation, which spread out from the post-communist world and interact with other political technology practices in the global era of post-truth and fake news. I have worked at the intersection of migration and social legal studies for the last 13 years, with Poland, Ukraine and Russia being the countries of my empirical interests and long-term fieldwork. My most recent book examines the everyday experiences of the law by migrants and refugees in Russia, in the aftermath of the so-called European refugee crisis. My current research project, supported by the British Academy, looks at the humans behind the international human rights claims from Central and Eastern Europe. This might not be surprising given the rather poor human rights record in the region, exacerbated by the recent retreat from the rule of law and political encroachments on NGO and judicial independence. But people do fight back. 
Polish citizens are some of the most active applicants before the European Court of Human Rights, despite Poland having joined the Convention relatively recently. Being part of such an interdisciplinary school as SIS allows important flexibility to study languages. Russian, Ukrainian, Estonian, Georgian, Polish, you name it, in small classes with a number of dedicated and experienced language tutors. The program gives you first-hand access to other disciplines like cultural studies or history of the region, which all aid a more comprehensive understanding of politics and sociology. SIS has an award-winning library with special collections, manuscripts, diaries, documents, and unrivaled resources in the entire Western world. Under the careful direction of our dedicated librarians, you will be able to pursue your own research focusing on primary resources at SIS. SIS also means seminars and conferences. Dr. Ben Noble runs the very popular SIS post-Soviet press group, which allows all students keep up to date with latest developments in weekly informal meetings and to present their own research on current news stories trending in the region. Dr. Noble also hosts a seminar series, See Seeing Now, which provides expert commentary on events unfolding in Russia and Eastern Europe, ranging from the files on the scribble poisoning, the Russian constitutional changes, or the case of Pussy Riot. And all this happens alongside many other events and seminar series at SEAS, to which you are, of course, all invited. Who will be your colleagues? SEAS prides itself in its international student body. You will meet students from the region itself, but also Asia, the Americas, Europe, who all bring their own experiences and viewpoints. And this all makes for a diverse and inclusive learning environment. Why not come and try it for yourself? What we are looking for in our candidates are strong academic credentials as a standard 2.1 in undergraduate degree, preferably social sciences or humanities background, and a clear interest in the region, which can be showcased in your personal statement. Students rightly ask where to look for a job after they graduate. During our MA program at SIS, you will receive support from your careers tutor, Dr. Ben Noble, and UCL careers consultants. You will also be welcome to attend special networking events with alumni and employer evenings with organizations such as Chatham House, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, as well as regional embassies who all look for the skills that SIS graduates possess. Our successful graduates go into wide ranging careers. Many of them find work in political institutions and NGO sector in the region, but also work globally with the UN, World Bank and consultancy sector, given the raft of their transferable skills. Some of our graduates also decide to go on further study and pursue PhD programs at SIS, Davis Center in Harvard or Oxford. Still undecided? Join us for virtual open days and Q&A sessions. Together with our student recruitment manager, Lisa, I will be there to answer any of your questions. We look forward to welcoming you in the next academic year. Thank you so very much for listening. So that's the video I prepared uh, for this year, this year's cohort. As I said to those of you who joined later, hi Isabel, hi Nazreen. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, we we cannot offer to the students as in the previous years uh, a placement at a university in Russia. Uh, the reasons I explained uh, are the fact that we have to follow the uh, law by the set by the United Kingdom government, and that law talks about uh, very strict sanctions. So that's one. And the second, uh, the universities with whom we have been cooperating very successfully in Russia has unfortunately the deans of those universities have unfortunately signed a letter 
which supports the special military operation, so to say. So that leaves us no choice but to suspend the cooperation for an, I think, uh, an indefinite time. But what I would like to add to the video, which you have shown, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, sort of focused on the core questions that students who usually come to the Q&A or the open evenings are particularly interested in. So what to see? So who are the people who are teaching? Uh, what about jobs and career post prospects afterwards? What about the resources available at SEAS? What about the student body? This video particularly focused on those questions. But of course, since the 24th of February, there's no business as usual SEAS. I mean, we, we have to mention the big elephant in the room, which is a full scale invasion on Ukraine and the full scale war on Ukraine. And in that sense, SEAS is almost the ideal place to study this. Uh, and that would be not only, I don't know, uh, those of you who follow sort of social media, I mean, Twitter, if it still exists, and the other developments, you would probably find out that uh, Timothy Snyder has recently started a course called, called The Making of Modern Ukraine. Well, if you, as you have seen in my video, he basically nicked that title from Andrew Wilson, who has been running this module for the last five years. And of course, this time, this, this year, this module is particularly updated uh, on this most recent development. So Timothy Snyder, check your sources, okay? But apart from that, uh, there was also uh, the post-Soviet press group, the weekly post-Soviet press group run by Ben Noble, but also um, Rasmus Nelson uh, this year, who uh, were students, but also members of staff come in and, and exchange the most recent or, or present reports on the most recent news from the region. And that really, uh, I've attended some of them over the past couple of weeks. It's every Wednesday at one, it's open to everyone. And, and you can see how sort of different narratives of the war in Ukraine emerged through that sort of meeting of the minds, for a lack of a better word, because, you know, the student body at SIS is diverse. They come from diverse walks of life. They also have access to different social media, different resources. So that's why I'm saying the, the meeting of these minds at uh, just 1, 1 p.m. on Wednesday also results in, you know, much more broader, much more richer coverage of the different developments of the war in Ukraine than the one, for instance, you would find uh, along on the mainstream on the mainstream media. And last but but not least, uh, uh, the format of our seminars, be it regular politics and sociology seminars, but also the CC Now uh, seminar that Ben Noble organizes, that also enabled us to already have the infrastructure in place to put spotlight on the war in Ukraine. So for instance, my research focusing on migration and human rights as part of the CCing now, I hosted a seminar focusing on the Ukrainian refugee crisis in Europe. And uh, I, I hosted it, I think, in in uh, March last year, uh, March uh, earlier this year, so yeah, a, a, a month after, or or a, few, a couple of weeks after the mass, uh, uh, the, the, the full scale invasion, the full scale attack, and this was uh, attended. This was online, so also attended by people from uh, different walks of life, open to students, staff, and also people just interested in the region. So that's another thing. Uh, so it was attended by more than 100, 100 different participants. But another thing which I want to put across to you is that CIS is not an ivory tower. We are not just an academic center producing knowledge about the about the region, but through those different avenues which we have, the, the seminars, the press group, but also the fact that our colleagues are quite often called on the media for commentary or work as policy advisors to the government or on the Chatham uh, or in the Chatham House, that also enables us to have you know, immediate feedback on our research from the audiences that we most are interested in. So the fact that you know, the research is never, you know, as I said, in the ivory tower, it's always constantly updated and made relevant with relevant policy recommendations for the region. So uh, that's as far as I think my introduction to the master degree. I think I can, with this, uh, mm, uh, audience of yourselves in place, I think I can speak at this sort of high level because uh, this also reflects the level of teaching 
at the master level, right? We were we are not delivering the modules at the undergraduate level. We expect interest in the region. We expect uh, maybe uh, not, you know, a prior uh, research experience, but uh, we expect from the students to have the the skills, to have the the interest, and that we will give them the required tools to do an independent research on the region, and through that advance their uh, both you know academic, but maybe you know policy or other oriented careers. So, any questions? I'll be super happy to take them. Thanks, Agnieszka. That was a really great uh, presentation. I hope that was really useful for everybody. Um, as we um, don't have too many participants in the session today, um, if you would like to um, put your camera on and kind of just ask directly, then um, please do feel free. But um, also, you're very welcome to put any questions uh, or comments in the chat as well. Kim, did you have a question? You, I saw you'd unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to ask. I, I actually did a master's at CIS quite a long time ago. Um, and I've been um, in Eastern European economics and transitional economics with Ukrainian language as a sort of ancillary um, late 90s. Um, I've been working at EBRD and the Foreign Office since. I'm now looking at sort of the next step. And I'm not quite sure. I'm looking at going back into to sort of studying and and I'm not quite sure what the next step is and I, I think it might be the MRES and so I'm sort of interested in 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 that maybe if you could take me through that and maybe if you have a an MPhil course that could potentially be um, with time converted into um, a, a, a doctorate sort of that that's that's the that's where I'm in, interested in sort of the next stage almost. I don't know if I'm in the right forum for that. I'm sorry if I'm taking other people's time. Uh, no, I think it's great. I'll be happy to talk about the MRES because I have experience of supervising students on that for the last uh, two years. And I would say that it's a, uh, it's one of the, uh, it's one of the most uh, flexible uh, degrees that we have, uh, but also the one that is the stepping stone to a PhD. So for instance, the student I'm supervising now, she is uh, designing her Emerus dissertation, which is larger than just, uh, or more extensive in sources than just her uh, normal MA dissertation or regular MA dissertation. And uh, we are factoring this, uh, as part or as a stepping stone towards her PhD degree. So the way, in, uh, it, it's basically what I want to say about the operation of that degree is that it focuses much more on the one-to-one -one between the uh, the supervisor and the, and, the, and the student. So she's taking modules across the different politics and sociology modules. She can choose uh, from the raft of the different modules we offer, but at the same time, uh, I'm working closely with her to define her research question and see it part of a bigger project or a, yeah, a stepping stone towards a bigger project that she will develop as part of her PhD. So for instance, uh, I think uh, Maria won't be too angry with me if I sort of disclose that she's very much interested in the rights of the LGBT plus community in Poland at the moment, a democratically backsliding Poland where uh, all the international indicators show that Poland scores the, the worst in terms of the uh, rights recognition of this particular group. But she is interested in the mental health impact. So she's almost working on, you know, intersection of, let's say, sociology and anthropology and public health. Uh, so uh, why we see the dissertation to be much broader, focusing on the public health, this dissertation now helps her to sort of find her angle, yeah, find her angle from which she would then approach her bigger DFIL or PhD, PhD project. So, uh, but uh, about the MPhil, Lisa, would you like to? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, Kim, there's, there's kind of several routes into if you want to kind of take it to the next step. Um, some students, you, you could potentially 
go straight into a PhD with if you've got a kind of refined topic, seeing as you've already got a master's. But if you're moving slightly into a different discipline or you are returning to study after some years, the MRES would be quite a good stepping stone towards that, which, as Agnieszka has already said, you can then develop into kind of a broader theme for your PhD and, and, and a larger study. In terms of the way that MPhil works here, you're enrolled automatically onto the MPhil slash PhD programme. So the idea is that students sign up for the full PhD um, and then are upgraded. I believe it's after a year, year and a half onto the, the PhD programme once they've passed the MPhil. Um, so we don't really recruit onto an MPhil as such with the idea that students will exit after that. Um, the, the kind of plan is to graduate them all the way through to the PhD. Some students don't, um, they have to leave study for whatever reason, and they can sometimes exit with an MPhil if they've passed the upgrade. Um, we will be doing an online Q&A with Dr. Kristin Rothai, who's the head of graduate research. Um, I'm just confirming the dates with her. So that might be a session you'd want to pop into as well um, and see which path you want to go down. Alternatively, you could come back and do another master's um, and that would be enough prep to then go on and, and apply for the MPhil slash PhD. The one thing I'll say about any research degree is having that topic um, kind of formulated enough um, to be accepted because that's the main thing and making sure there's someone here at the school that would be able to supervise that. Um, sometimes it is one academic, sometimes you might identify two colleagues um, if you're doing something that crosses boundaries or disciplines um, and that's kind of the joy of what we do here in, in that we do have those colleagues that kind of work on those intersections. Um, but um, do do keep an eye out for the for the PhD one as well. Um, and if you have any further questions, I'm happy to kind of have a chat about that in terms of the admissions and stuff. Um, if I could drop my email in the chat here. That's really helpful. Thank you, Agnieszka. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Then I understand there's two routes. It's the MRES if I'm not quite sure the direction I want to take, but if I have something, a, a topic that I'm, I'm quite serious about and it's fairly well developed, then I can look at the MPhil PhD route. Is, is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. My my best advice would be to identify someone at CEASE whose research aligns with your proposed topic, drop them a line. Ideally, we'd like to see something that's already half formed, kind of a couple of pages, so they can actually say to you, well, actually, this has got legs and it's worth developing. And quite often they'll work with you to develop that if they feel it's a viable topic or they can give you some feedback and say that's not something we can do or that's been done too many times before and um, have you thought about looking at it from this angle and, and your research methods the MRES is very good for research methods that's the, the other thing I'd say if, if you're not confident in that element um, MRES might be a, a path to follow in, in that case really helpful thank you thanks Okay. Uh, uh, but also sort of to pick up the, the, con the conversation with Kim and uh, join it with the last question we've been asked by Chloe, um, the, uh, the, all master programs really are very good at CIS for sort of giving the technical tools, uh, so the research methods modules that help either in better engagement with the region to study politics and sociology, better uh, comprehension, but also so then to develop your own research projects and your own uh, uh, yes your own research agenda in that in that area so for instance uh, all master programs will give you enough uh, enough uh, training in research methods to then pursue straight on the three year phd program so you don't have to apply for the mphil slash a phd so potentially extending it to four years, but you can straight go into the three-year uh, PhD, three-year PhD route, because the, 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 the training, the, the methods training, both qualitative methods training, that's a module I have been running uh, at master level at CIS, but also quantitative uh, methods training with uh, Ben Mo Monobel within the module called analyzing, uh, analyzing uh, data gives a, a variety of quantitative skills starting from first you know visualizing variables visualizing a relationship with variables uh, and ending you know at um, multi-level um, um, 
regression analysis or, or binary regression analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And that comes with also training in a, in a particular program, STATA, which, uh, which then gives the students you know, additional skills, both on the labor market, but also in terms of pursuing, pursuing the PhD. So there is a good case to be made for choosing any of our uh, master modules as a sort of stepping stone towards a PhD, given the raft of the methodological training that is provided. And uh, so uh, the Chloe's question uh, about not studying politics and sociology, I think my answer is quite relevant to that, that there will be modules that will be uh, that will give you the tools to study politics and to understand politics and sociology like the the methods modules, but also substantive modules like uh, the 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 ones I mentioned in the video, be it the, the, uh, you know the uh, politics and international relation module, politics and sociology, and indeed, indeed, uh, by our commitment to the program, we cannot teach them at an undergraduate level. Yeah, we we have to have. Uh, uh, we have to keep the standards of a, of a master type of engagement. But uh, in case you feel you um, this might be a bit too hard for you, or I mean, we we are extremely collegial department. Yes, my office door is closed at the moment because I'm talking to you guys. But normally, all our office doors are open, so the students are welcome either during office hours or on, you know, informal consultation, especially this is encouraged about the master level students, which we consider, you know, researchers in the making, you know, researchers on your own. So uh, come, you know, ask questions, ask for additional literature. This is, this is all part of, you know, a bread and butter of being a researcher at the, being a researcher at SEAS, I think. So I wouldn't worry at all about uh, uh, that sort of, previous lack of sociology or, or, or politics uh, training. Then there is a, a lovely question by Isabel uh, focusing on Aliona. Uh, so I want to also say that I think you're already getting the gist from, from what I'm saying, that we are research active people. Yeah, We are research active academics. Uh, as a result, uh, and Aliona is particularly one of the most research active persons I know. She's got a lot of projects. She is the author of the Informality Encyclopedia, which I think now runs in three different or four volumes. Uh, she, uh, she's, uh, uh, as a result, she might not necessarily teach her modules every year. This is normal. Yeah, this is this is how academia works. At the same time. Uh, at CIS, we are super collegial. So even if you get into a master program and you realize that, for instance, a particular module is not running this year, nothing prevents you from, you know, uh, requesting that academic to be your supervisor or from inviting, you know, from coming to their office hours or from engaging with their work on a more, you know, one-to-one -one basis rather than through a structured module. It's, it, I mean, there are different, being a, a master level at, at, at the master level student at CIS, I think gives you a much more flexibility in order to build that relationships with particular academics and their research beyond just, you know, taking part in the module. Modules. And you know, knowing Aliona, I'm sure she would be super happy to to talk to you, to give you the uh, the um, syllabus for that particular module, or even you know, run with you through the different weeks that you find particularly interesting during her office hours. I mean, she's a very very generous colleague. Uh, I mean, the way I experience the way I experienced her. So I think that would be um, that would be my answer to the, to the question. Can I just add something to that, Aga? Um, thanks. Just to say, we, we don't know at this stage which modules will be running because we're thinking kind of ahead to next September and we've only just started this year's um, teaching. But we normally do have an idea by June, July. Um, so obviously you will have applied by then. Hopefully you'll have got an offer. Um, but we will be able to kind of give you an indication of what will definitely be running by September kind of early summer um, and we send out information we update the website as soon as that's confirmed but as colleagues do go on sabbatical or research leave we just can't confirm it this early on um, but I think Agnes has kind of given an insight into how you might be able to interact with those colleagues in other ways if if they aren't teaching that particular year.
And just to pick up on your first question about how many applicants we take, um, we don't really cap our master's courses. Um, so it is a relatively small cohort. We're talking about three master's programs here, political analysis, political sociology, and Russian and post-Soviet politics. In a general year, we have between 25 to 30 students on those masters. Um, in total, we take in about 180 new MA students every year, and you'll encounter some of them because they may take modules from the politics cluster, same as some of you may want to take a language module or a history module. Um, in terms of applications, we receive probably around 50, 60 applications, so it's about one in two chance but as I say we don't cap the courses so if you meet the entry requirements which is a minimum T1 and your statement can demonstrate sufficient interest and enthusiasm and kind of knowledge of reading around the the area um, then the chances of getting an offer are relatively high but obviously we can't guarantee that until we've received your application I hope that helps great thank you so much thank you and sort of to add to this, the, the, uh, I completely agree with Lisa, while we do not cap uh, the, the places on the masters, what we really stress on is a small group work and small group seminars, uh, because this is, this is not an undergraduate degree. This is a very much sort of uh, much more specialized uh, degree, uh, much more focused degree, which I think uh, benefits from, you know, in-depth discussions in small groups, small seminar scenarios. So uh, the, you will be able to, uh, to have a much more direct contact the relationship with your uh, academic with the academic with your teachers the, the professors on the modules but also um, you know informal relation uh, uh, contacts with your with with other students on the on the program so that you know this the, the, uh, your learning can really be supported through that small group uh, uh, small group pedagogy rather than and in that sense i think it's important to stress how different the master is from from just a, a undergrad uh, uh, politics and sociology degree so then we have a question about uh, a master uh, being a master at vilnius university in eastern europe and russia and, uh, can you continue in this field at UCL? So again, I think that's more type of, I, I think you can definitely continue. I think that there's nothing uh, that prevents you from that. But in terms of the scholarships and the sort of PhD pathways, I think it would be better to ask these questions to Kirsten, right? Yeah, I'm going to put a link in the chat, um, which highlights the funding opportunities we have for PhD. Um, there are certain criteria you need to meet and obviously they are quite competitive because everybody wants or needs funding. Um, but that's what's available within the school. There's also the UCL scholarships finder, um, which gives you more of a global list depending on certain criteria again. Um, you absolutely can continue your PhD studies. As I said to Kim, a lot depends on the, the kind of research topic that you're proposing. Um, and that's really the first step for a PhD is, is to make that contact with prospective supervisors. So on our website, and again, I'll pop another link in the chat here, we have an A to Z of our colleagues, our academic colleagues, um, and you can read their research profiles and what they're working on. Um, and it's up to you to kind of approach those colleagues, I would say as soon as possible, um, with any proposed research topics that you're thinking that you might want to pursue your PhD with, um, and get some guidance from them as to whether A, they can supervise you because they do have kind of workload limits and they might already have lots of mentees, um, and B, whether they feel your topic is suitable um, and whether there's any suggestions they can give. If you're applying for funding, it is really important that you work with your proposed supervisor because the funding bodies will expect to see a really well-formed thesis topic. Um, and if an academic here is happy to support you, hopefully they'll be able to work with you to refine that somewhat so that when it does get submitted, you've got a better chance of getting those funding opportunities. So I hope that answers your question. Um, as I said, we are planning to hold a, a PhD session um, specifically for research degrees um, date to be confirmed. And as an academic who is on the receiving end of those uh, 
uh, request, please do start as early as possible, meaning September, October, if you want to start in the following academic year, because uh, we are now on the 23rd of November and the deadline for many sort of applications because of the competitiveness, they're for instance two step, right? So the first instance, a deadline for very popular ESRC sponsored PhD is in basically seven days. So it, it's, it, it's impossible to put a bespoke application given the competitiveness within that small short, uh, uh, small period of time, short period of time. So, you know, early October is a really good start to sort of uh, um, make those links, make those links. Um, so we have a question from Alessandro, uh, who's asking, what is the main difference between a one year and a two year program? And in particular, what differentiates uh, the politics programs that we have here from the uh, politics and security track on the IMS program. Uh, so Alessandro, very uh, many thanks for this question. Basically, all our masters, the ones that uh, we cover, so the um, political sociology, political analysis, and uh, post-Soviet uh, politics, they are all one-year masters. Uh, we do not run the two-year master, which I mentioned in the video anymore, because the second year was basically to be spent in higher school of economics in St. Petersburg. And what, the, what differentiates our master from the IMS, for instance, is that the IMS includes a second year placement at one of our partner universities. So in terms, uh, uh, I would say uh, the... IMS master is much more suited to people who want to discover the region, get a feel of how it is to study, but also live in a particular country and the country is associated. Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are countries in, uh, there are universities uh, in Finland, in Estonia, in Poland, in Serbia, and a couple and of the Czech Republic and Czechia or Czech and, and, and Czech Republic. So that the the, the IMS uh, there involves um, being placed for the second year and for the year of your writing dissertation within that institutional setting, and that also means writing your dissertation with the guidance or under the guidance of the academics in that particular institutions. So uh, because I'm examining those theses, I can see a difference between, you know, being uh, writing a dissertation in a Czech Republic university in, in Prague versus in Finland. I mean, this is all a, a sort of adjustment and the different flavors of, you know, producing knowledge that you'd be able to experience as part of that degree. The, the politics and sociology one-year masters that we are at CIS are much more condensed. They focus uh, on a um, substantive modules uh, on the politics and sociology of the region, but also methodological modules, like I already mentioned, qualitative and quantitative research methods training. And in that sense, they give you uh, a very sustained, I would say also very busy one year, but also in that sense, I think open your future. So you, you don't feel like you have now two year to sort of before you, you know, pursue your dream career or start your PhD, you really have this one year focused study. And then uh, you can, you know, get on with your yeah, either PhD or, or job much uh, much sooner. Okay, thank you so much. No worries, Alessandro, pleasure. If anyone has any more questions, please do feel free to ask now. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left in our scheduled slot, otherwise we will wrap it up, um, but I'll give people a couple of minutes in case there's any last minute questions you wanted to type or ask um, in real time. And I also... Oh, sorry, sorry, Sam. Oh, I no, also just... wanted to share my email just in case you have any questions afterwards. Just feel free to send it to me. I'll be super happy to respond. And I understand we're also going to have a in-person session on the 25th of January. So uh, if there are any other questions or you would like to see, you know, see physically, you're more than welcome to join us then. 
Yeah, that is correct. Um, we also, if you are interested in IMS, we've also got another one of these sessions for IMS, um, and that is next week, I think, on the 29th. Uh, let me just check the exact date and time of that. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in that event, then please do come along to that if you're unsure which is the right path for you. Uh, so that's, yeah, the 29th of November, um, and that's at 12 p.m. I've just put a link here for the event. Um, so feel free to join us for that one as well. I also had the last question, please. Sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, I mean, my area of interest would be the Balkans and Southeast, Southeast Europe, especially. And I was wondering whether in this module they had, I mean, I, I, how do you say, an intensive coverage or something, or I should apply maybe for the one that had the possibility to spend the second year in Belgrade, like the IMIS ones. And this is maybe more about Poland and like the rest of Eastern Europe. Uh, Alessandro, for sure, you're gonna get much more sustained focus on uh, the on on the Southern Europe if you choose the two year master. But it also is a little bit uh, unfair competition because you have. Uh, ability to focus within two years as opposed to one year right so you know we, we can't compare it's a bit like comparing apples okay, and sorry. oranges <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but do, do you know what i mean but no, because same... i applied for all four the open days and i just wanted to get the general taste of everything that's why the, oh, i mean that's that's great that's absolutely great and uh, but i think you know people at seas uh, i can think of eric gordy for instance who who do their research on uh, on the balkans and on the uh, Southeast Europe, they also offer modules in uh, at the master level that are available to the politics and sociology as well as the IMS students. So I think the difference would be that you know you, you would have the same education as far as CIS is concerned. You can you can choose the same modules whether you're IMS student or politics and sociology student. But with IMS, you're going to get that extra year to get a more immersive experience, and that really up it's up to you whether you know you you you're happy with the uh, intensity of the delivered modules during the first year and you know one year of study or do you also want to have this extra immersive experience afterwards and therefore i would for instance recommend the imus okay so the main difference is just in the duration not in the contents that's what i no. wanted thank you so much there's a last question from Masamichi um, saying, I've already got an MA in Russia and now applying for PhD. Last year, I had difficulties in reaching out to possible supervisors. In this case, is it better to study your MA program first? Um, I think this will depend on kind of what the difficulties were. Um, you know, if, if you had any feedback from supervisors, um, whether it was your topic that perhaps wasn't suitable or whether they felt that your academic background needed a bit more refinement. Um, so without knowing the exact details, it's quite hard to say. Um, normally we wouldn't expect students to take a master's with us if you've already got the equivalent from another institution with PhD as I've said a couple of times it mostly is around your research topic and the supervisor's feeling that you've kind of thought about your methods properly it's a, it's a viable topic that's going to last the duration of a PhD um if you want to, I'm going to pop my email in the chat, if you want to kind of give me a bit more context, perhaps um, offline um, with this, and perhaps if you've reached out to anyone previously and got any feedback, we can certainly discuss it with the graduate research tutor um, and see, because like I say, it could be a number of things. It might be that some supervisors just didn't feel they were the right person, they might not have had time, um, that there's a, there's a number of issues there. So I, if you want to drop me an email, that would be great. And then we can kind of look into that for you. Yes, this is Masamichi. Uh, I'm speaking from Japan. Thank you very much for the answering the last many questions. Thank you very much. You're Absolutely, welcome. I'll send the uh, email. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, well, I think there's, 
that looks to be it for questions. Thank you so much. Um, you've got our emails in the chat. Um, as Agnieszka said, we are planning to hold an in-person event as well in January. So that will be advertised shortly if you are near to the U to London or the UK and want to come along and meet us in real life, see the buildings, um, then we would very much um, love to meet you in, in person as well. Um, do and you this get in time touch? it will be with wine because you are all yes. above 18. Yes, great, <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, and good luck with applications. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you.